you both so much for coming. Uh, one of the things uh, it's been on my heart for so long is what does it look like to do ministry here? So, hey, guys, for those who are watching, my name is Velma Tim, and I do this uh, channel where we tell the stories of missionaries. And today I have two incredible people that I respect a lot uh, here with me, and they are all scholars, so... But then there are also people who love the Lord. At times people want to dissociate scholarship from an um, uh, intense relationship with God. But that's at times it's good when that comes together. So that's incredible. So they are going to just uh, share with us uh, a lot. I'm going to ask some questions and we are going to talk. We're going to have conversations. And what does it look like to be able to do ministry in the diaspora? What does it look like to be a mi on missions here in America? They'll share their stories and we're going to also talk uh, from a broad perspective. So... I want you to welcome with me Reverend Dr. Susan Moriti and uh, Babatunde is, is Dr. Just do just do Reverend Dr. Damix. Reverend me. Dr. Babatunde. There's other extra. So I call him my bishop because of, of, of that. So Reverend Dr. Babatunde, we are going to welcome them to this uh session today um i would like do you want to just introduce yourself say a little about who you are and then we are going to continue from there you want me to start yes yes so my name is baba tunde oladimeji uh, i'm from southwestern nigeria raised in lagos uh got to the u.s in 2012 fully and i have a family my wife lami oladimeji from northern nigeria and we are blessed with four children, a girl, Sophia, and three boys, Jubilee, Jethro, and Jesse. Jubilee is 12, Jethro is nine, and Jesse is six. And we live in Shadron, Nebraska. We pastor with the United Methodist Church here in Shadron, Nebraska. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Susan. Yeah, Susan Moriti, uh, originally from Kenya, um, married to Jeff, um, who is also a pastor here. We pastor churches in central Nebraska. I am in St. Paul, and he serves Wood River and Alder. We are blessed with two children, a freshman in college and a freshman in high school. Um, what else? Yep, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, and one of the things I like is that both of you, your 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 PhD was in missions. So I think there's a lot you bring apart from just experience is the scholarly aspect. But let's first start. What does it look like to be on missions in North America? You want me to start? Yep. Because uh, Susan is more scholar than myself. But uh, she's been teaching for a while. I think that uh, I will borrow from the language of uh, Philip Jenkins, uh, who uh, wrote an, uh, a book, a book, book, which he called uh, The Next Christendom. And then from Andrew Walls, uh, late Andrew Walls, who had argued over the years that mission for, for us in those days, it used to be that the West goes to the rest, goes to different, they go to different part of the world. But it, they argued that the world was coming to America. And that so what people have carved different words, reverse mission. But the argument is that the world is presently in America. And rather than just focusing on America or the West sending people out, the world has come to the doorstep of the missionary. And so what he needs to do is to begin to articulate how, what that will look like rather than just thinking about going out there, but to say, what, what is happening around me? Things are changing. And I think so that on that background, some of us who have come over here haven't learned those theories, sitting down and say, oh, that, that is true. We have a lot of people from different parts of the world in our classroom, in our neighborhoods, and the argument is that you may not be able to go there and comfortably reach out to people. But now we are now in a free world in America where it's freedom of speech and you can reach out to people. And on that basis is where some of us begin to see that. We'll still talk more about that. Not easy, but that is the basis for which we do mission. Okay. 
Suzanne, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, just very little. I think Tunde has said it very well. Um, I, I think I would just add that there was an erroneous understanding, um, especially stemming from Christendom, that um, you know, missions was coming from one place to the other. Uh, but now missions is from everywhere to ev everywhere. And um, I think the reason why they had that uh, faulty understanding is because in Christendom, when the king or the leader of a country said, I'm a Christian and you all are Christians, everyone was understood to be a Christian. And so that happened in the West a lot, especially in European countries. And um, they really did not see it as... Um, coming down to specifics to the people, to relationships, uh, to people living out rather than being, um, you know, told that you have converted because your king has converted. And so there is really no place that doesn't need missions. I think it's anywhere that the word of God needs to be told, sometimes anew and sometimes um, again because people have become complacent to the faith. Wow, that's awesome. As Yeah, it's just, you both are talking, I'm like, wow, I'm, I live in a neighborhood of less than 12,000 and we have about 46 different nations. Wow. And lots of people from the 1040 window that going there would be just so tough or risky for a missionary, but yeah, like they are behind my house. And yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's, Dive to the second question. What does America, oh no, let me reverse that. Does America need missionaries? Does Europe need missionaries? And um, and do they need specifically African missionaries? I know that's like a... <laughs> I'm going to push it first to Susan because I know that our dissertation was on discipleship and the rest of it. So I'm going to push that question first to her to bring out all the nuances uh, of that answer that question yeah I, I i don't know if it has anything to do with that Tunde, but um i i think honestly when we start categorizing to america or europe or africa we are missing uh our focus because um it's it's not necessarily a specific place it's anywhere where the word of god needs to reach and so it doesn't matter where that place is and it doesn't matter where those people are. Additionally, I think the world has increasingly become a global village so that there is no place that has just that people in it. So we have uh, British people living in America. We have Nigerians and Kenyans and Cameroonians and uh, people from the Middle East. And so if we say America, like who are we talking about? Because different people are living in different places as we have seen more um, immigration and people moving from one specific place to the other. And, and, and do they need African missionaries? Again, it's not about the race. <laughs> I think it's about um, who you know, God, whenever God introduces himself to us, it is always a privilege and a responsibility. So the privilege is that we have come to know God no matter where we are. And the responsibility is reach out to the next person, reach out to the neighbor. And so whether you're an African or you are a Middle Eastern person or you're a European, it's our responsibility. Um, we are blessed to be a blessing. I think that was um, right, I think. New Can you repeat me the mission of God? Yeah, new big, uh, Christopher Wright. Christopher Wright, yes. Yeah. So we are blessed to be a blessing. Um, we, we, when we, once we know God, we have a responsibility to make sure that that message reaches to others. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I so said thank you. I wanted to add more, you know. So so I, I think that one of the reasons why people ask the question, do we need Africans in America? I look at it from a cultural perspective that 
each region has something to bring. Just like Paul talks about the gift of the body, there are different functions, different things that different parts of the body could bring. And the eyes would bring what the nose probably would not be able to bring and the ears and other parts of the body. So I will argue that the, the Africans have some peculiar things to bring to the body of Christ, which is important, just like Susan talked about, that wherever we are, we have been called to be a blessing. We've been saved to be a blessing. And so whereas in those days, it used to be this idea that, okay, all the Americans or the Westerners, they have all it takes. They are the people who have the knowledge. But now we've come to see that there are, because of some of the peculiar environments and experiences that we've had in Africa and other parts of the world, there is something we are bringing into the equation that may be difficult for someone from a different culture to grasp, which is going to be very helpful. And, and some of us have talked about it at different places to say, for example, the, the Africans, the importance of prayer, dependence on God, it's very high because of the, the place since we live, you know, whereby you, you need to pray every time for everything. I, I said to people, I was raised in Lagos, Nigeria, and if my, my dad prayed almost every time you get in the car, you have to pray. You get to where you're going, you have to pray. You get back in the car, you pray. And you get home, you pray. And so if you went out with my dad four times, you may have prayed for 16 times, apart from the one you did in the morning and the one you did in the evening, and someone in the West will say, why Why do you have to pray every time? Well, it's important that you got to your destination safely because there are so many things that can happen to you. Some drunk rider or driver can run into you. So many things can happen. So people tend to depend more on God. It is not a disadvantage, it's an advantage. And so when Africans bring that into the system here, it's supposed to be an addition to what is happening to the church, to strengthen the church in the West. So that's where I will argue that there is a need for missionaries from Africa who've had that experience to bring that to bear on Africans who are here, but more, more than that, other people who are not Africans, that they can also enjoy that privilege of praying and other things like that. As, as I listen to you both talk, as I'm thinking of Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go, um, other versions say, as you go, make disciples of all nations so as africans come here as americans go somewhere else as europeans travel as long as you're a believer make sure you take that and we, when we bring that we bring the gospel also from our cultural perspective and and it's a plus it's a plus to wh wherever we go it's a plus to whoever receives that message thank you both so what does ministry in the diaspora look like for for, for you both Maybe let's compare it with your home country. What way? What are some of the advantages? What are some of the challenges you've been through? How has it been ministry, doing ministry in the diaspora? So let me begin since she started the other one. Well, it's a long story. It depends on which, which area you want to look at. But I, think, I think there are things, uh, there are privileges or advantages of, of the West. For example, you know, internet, I don't have to pay special amount of money you know these are just normal things that people have so communication you are able to communicate to different parts of the world access to resources the library that you have behind you is a wonderful library there behind me is a library here and even if you don't have the church has a library that there are in our little communities there are libraries there so you can have those to to study so those are advantages here that you may not have when you are back home. I will all, I will say from my own experience, there are also disadvantages. I guess that back home, people are more enthusiastic about the gospel. They are hungry. And so people are ready to listen. Once you get the word of God out there, people will sit down like the story in Acts of Apostles where Paul was preaching till the night until someone fell down and, and passed out. You know, that is an experience that you can find in many parts of Africa. People hungry, want to have the... I remember t teaching classes. The last time I was in Nigeria, I, I taught a class and we had... It was a doctor of ministry class or something. And we started the class in the morning. We had a break for one hour. The people left at, at six. They got back at eight. We continued from eight till four in the morning, you know, teaching. And, you know, we have our coffee, our drinks. 
people are just eager to learn. Uh, well, that in my own experience is not as 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 that here. People are already comfortable. They're like, oh, that's enough. You know, I'll check it. I'll check it out later. I don't have to stress myself. So that can create a, a, a sense of frustration for people like me. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I will argue Susan too, who have been in settings where you're teaching, you're preaching, you're traveling, and people are ready to receive. It's like they are dry like wood and you set the fire there, they catch the fire. But in some of our settings, you're forcing people. You're like, I said to someone not too long ago, I said, you know, someone in my Sunday school class, fourth grade Sunday school class in the church where I was raised has a higher level of the Bible compared to some adults that I have met. You know, when adults don't know the difference between Paul and Jesus, or if there was anybody called Paul, you know, that is not an actor, he's not a, he's not a Hollywood star, he's just a person in the Bible. You know, you get frustrated and you see all the facilities, you see the resources. And so, and I'm not generalizing, but some of the people I've been exposed to, that's what I see, that you're kind of forcing yourself and that they're, they're satisfied with a two and a half, a 25 minute sermon. Uh, whereas, you know, in in Lagos, Nigeria, someone is teaching for two hours and people are writing, you know. I'm used to taking a notebook to the church because when they are preaching, I'm taking notes. Here, you hardly, in my own experience, you hardly find people take down notes. They're just so, so those will be some of the challenges that I see. And then, of course, when we go to the issue of, of uh, differences in accent and culture and race, that could still be a problem in some places. Uh, uh, in the West and, and in America as it is, where someone doesn't see you enough as a pastor, you're not pastor enough, you know, compared to the other people that they know. That is what, that is getting better in some of our denominations, like the United Methodist Church, uh, you know, Global Methodist Church and a few other places. But we know that there are other people who are really challenged where, you know, people are not accepting you as they will accept you. So when a missionary comes from the U.S. to Nigeria, they will welcome you and they will give you everything that you need. They treat you like a king. That was what we have learned to do. It's part of hospitality. Sometimes that's not what you get when the reverse is the case. You don't have those kind of hospitality that you get, that you give to your contemporaries when they come over there. So those will be some of the things I will say just top of my head. Hmm. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, I, th I think. Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Yes. I think Tunde is so right. Um, on all those things and and how different. Um, I think the hunger that you mentioned is something that comes to my mind so quick. Um, how people are hungry for the gospel, for the preaching, for the teaching, and um. I mean, I know the hunger sometimes can result in um, in a disadvantage in a way because when people are so hungry, sometimes they are not even um, careful enough to check out what they are consuming. And so there is a likelihood for um, consuming erroneous messages. But, um, but, but people just want to know more about God. Um, the other big difference I have seen is, <laughs> so back home, um, I pastored congregations for 400, 500 people, several of them. Um, and we were constantly trying to build bigger churches, trying to fundraise for that. Um, on the other side of the globe here, we have spectacular spectacular cathedrals um with gosh how many people like if if we wanted to take a seat by ourselves everyone we could you know and still have more space left um and so that that is really, I mean, I appreciate the privilege of spaces and enough Sunday school classes Like you know, you can have children lesson here and you can have adult Sunday school here and you can have the youth rehearsing here. It's wonderful. Um, but also, um, 
the the numbers of people interested in investing uh in their spirituality is not um quite as much um i i think the the other thing and and tunde mentioned this a little bit is we so we we depend a lot on um just because of how our structures are are set we depend a lot on each other community um it, and just that's how life is that's how life is set um but i think in in more developed countries we we have a very, very self um independence you know um i got to do what i got to do uh you're sick you go to the hospital you pay by your own insurance um you you're hungry you figure out how to feed your family um back home you will send your child and say hey go to auntie velma's home and tell her to put some flour for you in this bowl i will go to the mail to get tomorrow and i will refund <laughs> or or maybe because we we get this from each other all the time that's it just tell her i got i got some more guests tonight and so that communal uh life um spills into the church and the self independence spills here um which becomes really difficult for faith because especially the christian faith was was made to be done in community like uh jesus fashioned this to be done together um someone was saying wherever there is a you in the bible it's not you individual it's you all like <laughs> kentucky y'all thing um so it's it's for everybody and so um i think also because of the many amenities and privileges people have here on how they they live it's easy to mistake that for um self sufficiency uh rather than uh having a need for god we we can easily slip into thinking oh i have insurance so i don't need prayers when i'm sick i just need to go to the doctor and pay this amount of money um and so it's a constant reminder to the people of faith in the developed world that yes yes insurance is good and good doctors are good and good hospitals are good but you know what we need the divine hand for health we need the divine hand for um safety i mean it's things like the war that is going on right now that kind of jerks people into reality that it doesn't matter all these things we have we actually need um um a divine intervention for life to go well so those are some of the differences like when tunda was saying his dad would pray 16 times in a day depending on how many places they visit i think it's easier for people there to realize that they really need that um than where systems are working you know when i feel insecure uh here i'm just going to call 111 um is it nine, 911 yeah, uh whereby uh when tunde is traveling from lagos to that corner where there is isis um yeah yeah 911 yes but but even more even more the protection of jesus um is really what counts wow man you guys have said some real profound things i want to give a follow up question uh there's something that you said that really got my attention we have so much research this so much knowledge available but the depth but but they said i'm a, someone in fourth grade and if you said that to him someone in fourth grade back home fourth grade Sunday school class back home have a lot more depth um, of scriptures of the word at times even maturity than an adult here why why do you think that's the reason why there's just so much availability of resources and what can we do differently i think you know we we will always remember not to so for those of people who listen to us who don't have that problem it's possible that in their church everything is fine and there are some churches 
but when we look at that yeah. in proportion, we will say we can generalize. And so I think that, I think when people have, so we had, uh, yesterday was Thanksgiving, and we had the Thanksgiving dinner at the basement of the church. And because I was an international student who had understood what it meant to be alone during Thanksgiving when everybody would go meet their family and you're just in the dormitory. That was what happened my first semester in uh, doing PhD. So we I challenged our church and we have we invited the students who are, who are around to come to the church and we provided food and probably we had 40, maybe 35, 40 students and a few of our people joined them. And when they finished the food, as I saw people dumping the trash in the trash can, it dawned on me again how much waste we generate in this part of the world. And I, I want to use that as an illustration to say that sometimes when you have a lot of things, there's a tendency for you to just pick things and not really consume them. So you want to have a taste of this, you want to have a taste of this, and at the end you just pinch them and throw them away. And I think sometimes people do that to scripture and to God's word. You have them NIV, RSV, ESV, you have Logos <clears throat> Bible software, you have ebook, you have audio Bible and all those things. And the tendency is to just take a little pinch and pinch here and pinch there. I remember when I you know, when I was doing my master's degree, it was done at the uh, university, University of Jos in Nigeria. The department had a library, which was owned by a professor, uh, an American professor, Danny McCain, had moved his books to the departmental place so that those of us who are studying religious studies could have dictionaries of New Testament to use and Greek Bibles, which the library never had. So I remember getting, every time we get there, I'm looking for books, I'm reading and I'm consuming, I'm borrowing overnight, trying to work on things. Now I have all these books here in my office and sometimes for weeks, I don't even have time to open one of them. So I think sometimes that's what happens uh, in, in a place like this. And I mm -hmm. will say that the best that we can do is for the pastors to continue, those of us who come from other parts of the world, to tell them how important to talk about the urgency, how important it is for people not just to pinch things, but to stay with it for a while. I think, and that's what I tried to do recently with, with scripture, to just stay with it. You know, even if you don't understand everything, just read it again and, and stay with it. So when, when we begin to encourage people not to be too microwaved in the, you know, we live in this very fast world. Everything is microwave. Everything is instant this, instant that. The tendency is for people to look for instant Bible study that we just deposit in their mm -hmm. spirit. And it doesn't work. You cannot have instant baby. You have to wait for the gestation period. And for anyone carrying anything that is of destiny, it has to spend, we have to spend some time Spending time with the Lord is not something that you can do in three minutes. So, so when we begin to encourage people to do that, and then maybe for some of them to see some of us, uh, our lifestyle, and I've had people say that about some of our Africans and other people, our Korean brothers, for example, they will take time to pray. Five in the morning, they are awake and they are praying. And people are like, what are they praying about again? Praying, everything. We remind them of what the scripture says. And when they see the impact of that prayer, then they may say, okay, like Jesus' disciple went to him, his disciples went to him and said, teach us to pray. They noticed he was, prayer was much more than just rehearsing something, it was a deep stuff. So I think that that would be something that could change as, as more people from the global south are involved in ministry here and are bold enough to bring that gift to the body, not afraid, but bringing it as something that is a gift and encouraging people to receive it, then I think we will be able to get what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think to add a little bit on that, um, uh, so the, a story is told of uh, somebody who went and saw um, a caterpillar, uh, you know, when they stop eating and they they quell themselves and they become, in, they get into this cocoon, 
Um, and it's like they were struggling in there and they went and just opened that whole thing to free it, you know, so that it doesn't struggle. And after a few minutes, it died. Um, and the moral of the story is that it's important to struggle in life a little bit because that is what makes you stronger. Um, I think uh, if we are not careful in a culture of affluence, when we have all that we will ever need, um, I'm looking at you guys' libraries. I I have, gosh, many books, not 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 here, but in the op on the opposite side of the room too. And I'm looking at them. I'm like, when was the last time I actually pulled a book? Um, and I think when people have this kind of affluence in terms of um, materials that we need, in terms of personnel, right? So every pastor has a church. One, I remember. Remember, I pastored 14 churches, you know, and that meant that for three months, that church never got to see me until three and a half months were over. Then I would go there again and give them communion. It was hard. What happens when people are living like that is they, because of the struggle, they learn to be strong. They learn to preach. They learn to lead Bible studies. They learn to teach Sunday school. It's just the only way to survive. Um, but when you have your pastor who is a leader of worship, who is going to pray for you every time, you can just make a phone call and say, Pastor, hey, we need you here. We are sick. <laughs> you know, or hey, what, what are we going to do with the children's time? Pastor is here. Um, Nothing wrong with uh, having a pastor to a church or actually three pastors to one church. Um, but the tendency is people relax. And so that is why you will meet a congregation where people have been in the church for a long time. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to read scripture out loud. They don't know how to lead a Bible study or a Sunday school class. Not their fault, but it's because there is so much given to them that they have not had time to struggle so that they can flap their wings until they are an actual butterfly that can fly. And so I think, uh, Velma, when you are asking how does ministry look different here? And, and this, this actually speaks to what Tunda was saying about my dissertation on discipleship is one of my biggest goals is to, um, is to urge people, is to stir people to take active roles, not because the pastor is not available or the pastor can't do it, but because you actually need it for yourself. You need, you need this for yourself. Nobody can be a disciple on your behalf. Nobody can, can preach the word of God on your behalf. Nobody can do missions on your behalf. We have all been called. And so just, just making sure that people understand all these comforts should not make us um, weak and um, non-involved in what is going on around us. Wow, man, so much wisdom in the room. So much wisdom. I'm going to 